I've not told my mum yet that I'm resigned. Maybe not. <laughs> That'd be interesting to see <laughs> she finds it. Right, let me just... Oh. Happy Friday, everyone. Hope you're all doing very, very well. Um, first of all, apologies for my quietness in the group recently. Um, I've been really, really busy with uh, hiring and interviewing lots and lots of people who want to come on and shift success to, in fact. Uh, so I've kind of been preoccupied with that. Um, but today I am joined by a phenomenal Shifts to Success member. Um, this particular individual joined Shift Success with his lovely wife last year. And uh, he's been in the job for many, many years previously. He's seriously got shit done he's put in the work he's changed his mindset and he's going to be sharing with you his journey today um, but also the insights that he's picked up along the way um, because you know he's already had a business with his wife but actually he's built a new business even during the worst global pandemic in mankind so without any further ado bill betts welcome how are you hello yeah really good really good thank you yeah good stuff good stuff finally glad to get you on the uh, the podcast mate it's uh, it's good to see you um, <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the first questions um, that I like to ask people who are on uh, the podcast is uh, where are you from and what were you like growing up as a, as a kid? So I'm um, from Kent. So um, I was born in Sidcup, but we moved down to Kent when I was young and um, I've always lived in sort of little villages. So grew up around Braybourne, which is a really nice little village and went to a really nice um, primary school. There's like 70 of us. Um, it was really nice there. And then just went to a normal secondary school in Ashford and lived down on the marsh. Um, <laughs> sort of <laughs> a bit of a Martian, um, but lived with my my mum and dad and my stepbrother. Mum um, and dad were always at work. They worked really hard. Um, and I'd go to the office uh, with my dad and do photocopy and stuff with him like that. So, um, yeah, it was, really, it was a nice childhood. We Living down the marsh, we had some land and had a little motorbike to run around on and air rifles and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed sort of growing up. But um, what was the other question part of that? Yeah, well, what was you like? Was you like, a, you know, was you academic? Was you a bit of a, a mm. troublesome child? Was you naughty? Or was you... No, I, I think, I, I personally think I could have done better. I, that's probably like every bloke's probably said that. I could probably have done better. I don't think the school that I went to really pushed me. I was on the cusp. We have the grammar system down here. So I was probably on the cusp of um, the grammar stream, like do badly there or do well in a normal school. But I was never really pushed. So um, I came out of school with um, some GCSEs. I treated my A-level time as like my, I knew I didn't want to go to university. So I treated my uh, A-level days as my university days. But uh, that's why I met Emma actually doing our A-levels. And I think wow. we worked out, yeah, I think we worked out that um, we were the only people in the school doing exactly the same A-levels. Wow. Um, so you met Emma back in, in college in sixth form. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Right. Who made the first move? Did you, did you know, <laughs> a glint in the uh, old wink or... Well, uh, this is a bit awkward. Uh, I was actually seeing Emma's best mate. <laughs> 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 um, Bloody how you sly dog you, Bill. Yeah, so I was um, I was seeing uh, Emma's best mate. Emma had moved out to the to the states just after a GCSE. So dad dad was a pilot, and he'd moved out to the states to start a flying business, but it didn't work out. So she came back to um, England and came back to the school where we were at to do her A levels. And uh, I just remember, you know, we had the same time off together because we were doing the same classes. I just remember always hanging out in the library and um, wanted to be to talk to Emma. So, you know, it all broke down with her best mate. And then probably a week or two later, I got together with Emma. Um, it caused a bit of friction, but, you know, it was meant to be, wasn't it? We're, we're still together. So ladies man i love it i love it i love it i love a good romeo and juliet story it's good it's good um great so obviously you you've come from a great background growing up lovely childhood um could have been done better as a kid as we all could to be honest um and a levels you know, why by the way why, why didn't you want to go to university was that just something you just didn't want to achieve for yourself or the debt aspect yeah. or something else i didn't i suppose i didn't Looking back at it, I didn't really see the value of doing it. Um, I didn't think I was really going to achieve anything. I didn't want to go into debt. Um, I just didn't fancy going and doing that. I just, um, I must have had an idea about going into the police because if I find my 
uh, like Lieber's book, everyone sort of wrote in and signed. There's like, oh, Bill the Piggy and stuff like that in there. So <laughs> I'd obviously um, sort of told people that I wanted to be in the police or, want, or had thoughts about joining the police um, because obviously they, they were aware of it and they were making fun of it already. So, um, and Emma um, was a veterinary nurse or she was um, working at a vet's and had aspirations of being a veterinary nurse. And we just didn't really want to do that. We, um, we left school, did our A-levels. We both went and got jobs. I got a job in insurance. Emma carried on working at the vets. And then we moved out, moved out at sort of, I think it must have been sort of 19 years old. We moved wow. from more cottage to rent. Emma really wanted to get out of home. I was quite scared about doing it. Um, but we found this cottage uh, in Tenton High Street. It was like brilliant location. It was 250 quid a month. So Emma was like, let's do it. And she sort of took took the ball by the horns and went and rented it. And we moved in together at 19. Wow. Wow. Date. That might not be the right date, but it's around then. <laughs> <laughs> you start, started young. You started really young. And, and going back to insurance, you know, did, was that kind of a, a sales role? Was it like a, a, a brokerage role? What what was it like? Um, it was, well, it was customer service. So if you had a car policy with Royal and Sun Alliance and you um, phoned up about it, you'd, you get someone like myself to deal with your change of address, change of vehicle, um, stuff like that. And then um, there's there's always been something with my jobs. I always start the job and then I sort of let myself down and I was like screwing, getting the paperwork and hiding it because I didn't quite know what to do with it maybe. And um, so I got into a little bit of trouble to begin with, but then once I got my feet under, under the desk, I sort of knuckled down. And at one point I actually found uh, a glitch in their system where we were sending out the certificate of insurance to people, but they'd never actually paid us for it. So the renewals weren't getting paid. So mm. I started, put my hand up and said, hey, this is not working. And I got put onto sort of a special project for six months, asking people for their money, for their money or cancelling their policies. And that kind of made me think, hold on, I'm still earning the same sort of money and I'm sorting out a problem for you here and um, getting you more, getting you money in or cancelling your policies for you, but you're not really giving me anything in, in return for it. So that left me a little bit like, well, oh, it's not, not great, is it? And then I just remember getting into a bit of a rut, you know, we'd go down the pub at lunchtime and I'd stare out the window at Maid, like looking out into Maidstone thinking I could really, I'd really like to be outside right now doing something more practical. Mm. Um, and that's where I started sort of researching the police and seeing if that's something that I could do. Cool. Okay. So you and Emma move out to a lovely cottage, 19 years old, you work in insurance and you kind of get in, you know, the job's not for you, technically. And then yeah. you start thinking about the police. So do you, is, is that your after insurance? Is that something you apply for straight away, the police? Well, yeah, I was, um, I was looking into it. I like to do my research and I like to um, sort of look into everything about it and around it. And then suddenly uh, Royal and Sun Alliance was making people redundant. So uh, I think I asked for voluntary redundancy, which worked out really well because I was in the throes of applying for the police at the time. So that's perfect, wasn't it? It was like stepped out of one job and went straight into the police service. So amazing amazing so, so how, how really old are you at the police then how would you was you 20 21 21 21 uh 23 23 yeah. wow okay so really 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 young um and what was that like for you you know was it, it was exciting you know you're a cop now you've got these powers you know and what was that like for you your first kind of i don't know month or two um scary uh i, I think so growing up and moving out, you know, there was always periods of um, anxiety as well. So I'd always had periods of anxiety around stuff. Um, I'd seen my, um, my, my dad's obviously worked in the same job all his life and he was quite stable, but I'd seen my mum getting made redundant quite a lot throughout growing up. And um, I was always worried about buying houses and money and stuff like that. So I think that's what probably like pushed me down that um, sort of police career, stability, pension, you know, <clears throat> we, well, I actually thought the money <clears throat> for a 23 year old was actually quite good. Yeah. And, um, I think it was at the time. I think it was then. And so, you know, I remember always having sort of a bit of anxiety around, you know, credit cards or bills and stuff like that. So joining the police um, was good financially, 
but I got to, I went through we had Ashford training school then I went through Ashford um they called me rhino at Ashford I was apparently quite abrupt and uh, quite bullish um and I went to Maidstone to do my 10-week tutorship and I was put on a team and I did I did, I did raise this. I was put on a team where my dad was actually acting on behalf of a complainant against some of the colleagues on my section. Wow. Uh, and I was like, this is really awkward. And we tried to change my location. We tried to move, get me moved to another team. Um, I think my, my actual tutor was maybe one of the people that he was, my dad was dealing with as a, you know, didn't it, he, was, he was helping the person complain against the police and against the people that I was, working with um so that but again that just fueled that anxiety in me and we were so busy and i got really stressed and then i just quit i left you left <laughs> i resigned yeah you, you resigned from the police i resigned i resigned from the police i just i, I it was that like fight or flight moment where wow. i just didn't recognize myself that i was so stressed and overwhelmed by it all i just left so, and, so let, uh, let me get this right. So you've just joined the police. You've, yeah. You know, it's, things are going okay, but then this the situation happens, and you. Th so I don't know this story. I, I'm shocked. I know, I know. <laughs> so you just, so you just basically resigned. So how many years were you in? Was you a year in or less? I got my pension, like the pension back and stuff. Um, it was only well, I'd done 15 weeks at Ashford. I'd done um, two weeks at Maidstone Train School, and then uh, 10 weeks on the wow. street training. So. And uh, yeah, they broke me. <laughs> wow, okay, so what, so what happens next then? Where'd you go? So, um, so I, I knew, you know, I started going, well, maybe I could use my skills and go back as a special. And I was like, what, what are you going on about? What's, what's all this about? Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of, um, I knew that I'd done wrong. And so, and I think Emma had actually quit her job as well. So we both found ourselves like unemployed. <laughs> and uh, like, how did this happen? <laughs> so, um, I immediately, pretty much immediately, wrote a really long um, letter to recruitment, and uh, I met and I, I went to a recruiting um, day, a Kent Police <laughs> recruiting day. Yeah. Uh, I bumped in. I met a guy called John Navarro, and I, I always remember him because I explained my whole situation and you know the fact that I was put on that team where my dad was. Um, you know, dealing with complaints against them and stuff like that. And uh, he managed to get me another interview with a, 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 an interview panel. And again, you know, really honest with them, explained like what had gone on, how I was feeling and maybe the overwhelm and the stress. And I managed to get my job back and I got my, my force number back as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Wow. I've never, I've never even heard that happening before. So you literally resigned early doors and went back in. Yeah. And they said, you know, you're you're only we're only going to accept you back if you go to another area. So they sent me to West Kent, where they believed it was maybe a bit more quieter, and uh, perhaps I could deal with the stress a bit better. But um, never, I didn't look back after that. I did my training. I went out onto West Kent. I policed um, the Royal Borough of Tunbridge Wells, and it's not as posh as you that might sound. <laughs> but I I was put on a, a fantastic team. You know, no one sort of questioned me. I don't know if they really knew the past or, and we just went for it and, and really enjoyed, I did five years on that team. And that was just like a fantastic um, start. And I went from being so stressed and overwhelmed at Maidstone to probably worked far too much overtime, weekends and volunteered for everything. It was brilliant. Wow. Amazing. That's good to hear. So how are the roles did you do in the, in the police? So I did um, section or like 999 response um, for five years at Tunbridge Wells. It was a really close knit team. We worked really well together. Um, it was a really nice town to police as well. You had all elements in there. You had like nice people to deal with. And then you had the drunks, the druggies and the, the criminal, like proper burglaries and um, travellers to deal with. So it was a real mixture of crime. And a lot of people in Kent will go, well, Tom and Wells, nothing happens in there. But <laughs> it was a real sort of, uh, it was a real good five years. But I started to feel as though I was dealing with the same thing, mm. maybe getting a bit complacent um, with it. Um, and so I started to look at other roles. And we had a guy called Ryan Law came um, over to our team as our sergeant. And he had just left the firearms unit and he was like, um, 
everything that I thought the firearms unit was like, he was not. So um, I always thought the firearms unit was like old and uh, grumpy and arrogant and stuff like that. But he was like, no, we're really friendly guys and girls, you know, come and I'll help you join. I'll help you um, get you through the process and get you through the fitness and the interviews and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that was, uh, he started to so size mentor me to become a firearms officer. Amazing. And you became a firearms officer for how many years then? Um, 12 years after wow. that. So, wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's not an easy job to get into. And he did a lot of mentoring. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we'll definitely go into mentoring soon because now you are an amazing mentor to your clients. So <laughs> let's, um, so essentially you've you left the job, you left the police, got back in, uh, started loving the job and you've gone into firearms now and you stay there for quite the majority of your career and that is a hard job to get into um so where did you know where did where did it happen in your career so how, how long were you in the police in total so i believe it's just around to 19 years okay so it's difficult because i've left and come back <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's just call it 19 years so 19 years where did it start to go wrong yeah yeah well i don't like to use the word wrong where did you start thinking of yeah, is this for me anymore you know, where did you start to think, can I see myself for the duration of my career in the police? Yeah, so, you know, um, Emma will tell you, I was proper, like, job pissed, I suppose, is what the word, isn't it? I was like, I would argue until I blew in the face that the police were doing the right thing and they knew what they were doing and they were doing the right thing, like, they are doing the best of their job that they could. And um, I suppose to become a bit institutionalised in that five years at Tunbridge Wells. Um, so 2005, we bought our flat and moved out of our rented and bought our flat and Emma started her pet grooming business, A to Z Animal Care. So um, she started that um, probably because of, it was easier to start that because we had the salary um, from me being a police officer. So we had the stable income, we could get a mortgage and I've got um, part, it was uh, moat, ho moat housing gave us like, £40,000 deposit towards a flat, which we just, they said, pay it back. You know, it's part of key worker scheme, wasn't it? And you nice. can pay it back um, at some point. So um, 2005, we, Emma starts her business, but she starts it with her dad. So I'm not really part of it. She starts it with her dad. He's had multiple businesses in the past and he's helped her. So 2008, I've gone into firearms and everything's like, everything's good. You know, I've really, I've really enjoyed the role. I became... Um, a team's medic, so uh, the medics in Kent sort of sit between um, a technician and a paramedic. So, you know, we got quite a lot of good jobs, a lot of trauma jobs in. But uh, I don't know when Theresa May really stuck the knife in. I can't remember the year, but I remember sitting on the sofa with um, my parents were in the, in the room, in the sitting room as well. And I remember the sort of, that's it, the pension, the pension things changed. And for me, that was just like, it was like having my guts ripped out. I just couldn't work out why or how they could do that to us and how we'd signed on that dotted line and just gone, no, you're not doing that anymore. You got your, for some people at work, they had their whole life mapped out for that pension. They had their family going to university and how they were going to pay for it. And then their kids would finish university and then retire. And it was just so gutting. And for me, um, professionally, that was like my, my own little mini protest was I stopped doing overtime. I refused to do any overtime whatsoever. Bank holidays, don't want them anymore. You know, I might do the odd one now and then, but any, any kind of voluntary overtime, I just didn't want to do it. And that was my, my mini protest against the uh, pension changes or what was going on. Mm. So that professionally for me, that and the cuts and the cuts in the budget that started to change everything for me, and I started to see how that was starting to tear apart the police service that we knew um, with all the cuts and the lack of people. I don't know where everyone went. Mm. I, I, just over a year or so, everyone just disappeared, and all of a sudden, there just wasn't any of us. You know, firearms was good because. They were protected, so I always had someone in the car with me, you know, always double crewed and we had a good team and we had minimum numbers. But when you looked at the sections in the area, it was just like, where is everyone? Where's everyone gone? I just mm -hmm. couldn't get it. Wow. Um, so professionally, I think that's when when things changed, changed for me. And I'm sure yeah. others sort of um, 
feel the same about that pension change. Yeah, I, I hear it all the time. Uh, you know, it's one of the key yeah. reasons why people are thinking about business. So for you, it was kind of the beginning of the end, right? That was kind of the first instance where you started thinking, actually, this isn't this isn't right. And uh, you started to think a bit differently about your career and the job. Yeah, and I started um, getting more involved in Emma's business as well. And I say sort of now, once you open that business head, once you start looking at things from a business point of view, it's very hard to shut that box. It's very hard to stop looking at things as a business. And, you know, me and Emma would have discussions about bringing business into policing. And I'd be like, no, you can't run a, a police service like a business. But then you start thinking, actually, <laughs> maybe you should start running a uh, police service as a business because you might actually well first you realize it's failing and do something about it but um you know the whole thing about if you don't spend your budget you lose it i mean what's that about where, where's the investment where if you don't well done for not spending your budget um and you can save a little bit more and build up you know build up that buffers when you need it but yeah things like oh you got this overtime budget comes sort of february everyone's out doing overtime to spend it because they've saved it and saved it, or if we don't use it, we lose it. That's just like the whole um, way that they run it is just so wrong. And then you start looking at it going, this is not right. And I don't want to, like, I want to change it, but I can't. So I don't know if I want to be part of it anymore. Mm. So focus, you focus on something you can change, which is ultimately your career, right? Yeah, the, um, I think, you know, we, I joined Shift Success in March. So I was probably last year, but I was probably, not I didn't have that vision to that and people were saying to me well why didn't you go and work with your with your wife in dog grooming I was like this just isn't the stable sort of reliable income in that to do that although we'd always been looking for some kind of mentorship we'd contacted many people over the years they've done reports and it's like yeah tell us something we don't know now this is why we're trying to this is why we want to someone to help us because um, we want to sort of scale the business but on a personal um personal note as well um our son tom in 2008 was uh or 2008 he wasn't even born 2013 was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as well and i think so you've got sort of two levels you've got the the sort of personal life started to not fall apart but start to get really stressful with the diabetes and and helping tom with that and then you've got the professional life where um, you know, your pension and your pay and stuff's getting ripped apart. And um, they, they sort of came together and the trauma that I was watching at work and dealing with at work, um, it eventually just culminated in a big sort of breakdown. I just couldn't do it anymore. And, you know, that, that saying where your cup is full and the cup fell over. Wow. Well, so let's, let's talk about that second because you're not the only one. And, you know, I've had my own mental health um, issues when I was 21, not police related, but personal issues. Um, for you, you know, and, and the trauma that a police officer sees, because there's actually people who listen to this podcast who are not police officers and they're from other public sector workers as well and other people who want to get involved in business. The trauma that you see on the job and the things that you deal with, um, you know, when do you start to notice that's having an effect on you? You know, is it due to sleepless nights? Is it due to not being able to handle a job anymore or being snappy with people? How did that come out with you when you first start to notice, actually, something's not right here with my mindset? It's definitely, um, like you're saying, the snappiness. So at home, I'd have very little patience with the kids and um, get quite angry and quite cross and um, get to that point where it just snap, and I'd never do it. I'd never like smash the window or thrown something, but I could see myself doing it. I could get so angry and I could fit, pick something up and just smash it, you know? And um, me and my little, my, my little son, Josh, we, uh, we just clashed or we used to just clash. And I'd find myself sort of having a go at him and, and uh, he'd be crying and I'd be like, right, you need to walk away, you need to walk away. And, and I'd go back and carry on. And that's that sort of anger and frustration and, um, that was coming out in me. And I remember um, I remember Emma sort of saying, you need, to, you need to go and get some help. You need to go and see a doctor and stuff. And I was like, no, you, you typical sort of maybe a bloke thing where you don't really know, you don't really believe in that or you don't know 
um, what they're going to say. And also, I've got that position as a firearms officer where if I start putting my hand up and saying I'm suffering, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to lose my role? Am I going to lose my job? Well, obviously, we'll go on to that probably later. But, yeah. um, you know, it's very hard to be... I could recognise it myself and I'd, I'd take the kids to school and I'd be driving home on a rest day and I'd just find myself crying. And that's when you start thinking, I need to do something about this. But you still carry on going to work, don't you? You still put on that suit of armour and um, you still keep carry on filling up that pot and keep filling up that cup. And I remember being on a on a, a call on a main, in Maystone on a, I think it was a Friday night and a guy had been punched in the head and he died and we were doing CPR on him and my team were around us and I was the, I was the firearms commander for the, for the whole of Kent County and I could feel myself like, almost crying and I was like this is just not right is it it's just the overwhelm of all the issues and that it's time to to have a break and I think um I remember having a a PDR a review with my sergeant he was like is there anything you need to tell me I'm like yeah I need to go and get some help <laughs> and he was like what <laughs> I've just been given an outstanding PDR I mean when does that ever happen that's only happened once in my life and then <laughs> I just said to him I need to go and get some help. I'm, I'm a mess. Um, and then uh, I think admitting that to, to him and then admitting it to myself. And then we got, I got caught up in a um, police shooting as a medic. I was on the periphery of it and um, went, went into the scene as a medic. But as part of that, we were given um, access to counselling. And I sat in that counsellor's chair and we probably spoke about the shooting for like two minutes. And then an hour of Tom and the um, the anxiety and the, the worry that I had for Tom with his diabetes just came out. And I think again, that kind of opened the floodgates to then admitting that I've got this, this issue with uh, that I need to get some help with. And I suppose that was the end of my firearms career, I suppose. Mm. Wow, wow. I mean, this, you know, it's just amazing to hear, Bill. And, you know, I know you're in a better place now, um, yeah. But it's good to speak about it because I know, you know, cops who watch this or listen to this and other people who listen to this, you know, maybe they might recognize these things themselves and hopefully they reach out and don't do themselves harm. So um, with yourself through the situation, you, do you do you then obviously go and see a doctor? Do you keep up the counseling? Is it like a weekly thing? Is it a monthly thing or? Yeah, so I used to go to counselling before late terms. I didn't actually tell anyone at work that I was um, doing counselling. I'd go to go to them before late and then go to work afterwards. It totally takes it out of you. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'd sit in that counsellor's chair in, in bits. I'd be in tears, you know, and it was all this stuff around Tom and his diabetes. And I, they basically, they sort of said, you know, you've been living with anxiety and that anxiety is then developed into depression because you've not you've not dealt with it and all that worry that you've got around your son you know I was I was sitting in a I remember one incident where I was sitting in a police car at night and I just started sort of dreaming or daydreaming that Tom you know I started planning like I got a phone call from Emma and Tom was like in cardiac arrest and I'd plan how I'd get to my house and then I'd plan how I'd go up the stairs and I'd plan what kit I'd take with me and I'd plan what what actions I'd take and how I'd help Tom and stuff like that. And, you know, you like snap out of it. It's not real, but mm. that um, you, start, you start sort of on your days off, you start looking at people walking down the high street and you're like, well, what happens if you have a heart attack or keel over? And, and that's that trauma stuff that um, I've been exposed to and starting to get that like hyper, hyper awareness or hyper vigilance around sort of the medic work that I've been doing and starting, everything was like contingency planning. What, what if, what if, what if, and it just wears you out. You just, you just get so tired about it and get knackered. <laughs> yeah. And tired, tiredness, then for me, tiredness is a big trigger for being overwhelmed and then like not, not being able to deal with situations, so. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, great, great story as well. So at this time, you, you've obviously going, you're seeking help, which is great. And obviously, because your firearms, you know, you, that's, you've got to be, you know, I'm, I'm assuming on top form for that, because if you've got to pull that trigger or deal with certain situations like terrorists, et cetera, you've got to be, you know, tip top. So have, they, have you, you tell the force and they say, look, we need to sort this out or? 
Yeah, so um, it all culminated. I think once I told my sergeant that I need some help, he was like, okay, that's cool. We'll sort that out for you. And I started that counselling. Um, but, you know, that's the beginning of the admitting to yourself that you've got something to sort out. And I remember um, me and Emma were having some issues with a, a, a person that worked for her at the time. And I can't remember what the issue was, but we were sitting in a coffee shop. And Emma was like, have you done this bit of paperwork or something? And uh, that was it. That was the, it just snapped. And, and um, I had to, Emma had to sort of take me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and said, like, you're going home and putting you to bed. And she phoned the doctor and um, started medication. And then then I had to sort of admit to the, to the force, you know, I, I need some time off. And uh, when I come back, I'm going to be medicated. And X, Y, and Z, you need to see where we go from there. Wow. Wow. Okay. Amazing stuff. And I'm assuming that's because if the medication, the medication might make you drowsy, then, you know, you might not be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, we'll go on to them in a second. And uh, I have, you know, the power couple that relationship you have is, it's amazing. You know, it's something that I aspire to be like, you know, with my, you know, partner, it's really amazing to see. Um, so you mentioned shift success. How did you find out about me? How did you find out about shift success and, and the team? Um, it's Facebook ad. I think uh, you always say like, you know, coppers really hide on Facebook and they're hard, well, you know, Facebook can find anyone. And uh, it must have just been a Facebook ad. I had a really um, bad sort of couple of days at work. I was being told that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Um, I'd been, I'd taken myself off firearms duties and I'd been put into a training role, which I was really enjoying, but I was coming up to some barriers and, I was just getting sick of it and trying to work out where I was going to go. And um, your face, I'm sure it was a Facebook ad that popped up and the scorecard quiz. So complete the scorecard quiz. And then, you know, now I don't normally answer the phone to, people, to numbers I don't know. And this is, this is the whole sort of, I don't know, you could call it fake, couldn't you? Because I just went through your whole process and I, you know, I wouldn't normally answer to the phone and talk to people. I don't know why I'd, I'd complete a scorecard quiz without the intention of actually speaking to someone at the end of it. I didn't really know what it what it was, you see what I mean? And I think my score was like, yeah, you need to get a business or get out. You could probably tell me, but yeah. um, I answered my phone. I made an appointment to speak to uh, your sales lady. Um, and then I think I spoke to her. I was sitting in the car park at work. So it must've been like five o'clock in the evening. And uh, I said, oh, I can speak to you on my way home. She was like, no, I need to, I want to speak to you whilst you're not driving. I remember that. Yeah. And um, it just so happened you had your quick start day coming up and I was a rest day. And again, it just falls into place, doesn't it? And I just said, to, I think I'd even signed up before I'd even said to Emma, I just said to Emma, I'm going to Birmingham on, I think in a week's time. It was really short notice. Wow. I'm going to Birmingham to go and have a look at this, this business company, this shifts to success i can remember i can remember, and, I can remember and we started, yeah and then we started to do the sort of research and the um you know the youtube um you must have sent me your book um you know you start look you start doing the research youtube for me and the podcast for me was the big thing because suddenly i realized watching everyone on youtube that there was a real theme and there's a real theme going through um, some of your clients and some of us is that mental health side of things and how um, how poorly we are treated by our police forces. And another thing that it made me realise was it wasn't a Kent thing. It's a police service thing. It's across the whole of the UK. So I suppose it helped me in a way that I wasn't being victimised, as in it was Kent was dealing with me poorly. It was a whole of the UK was leaving um, police officers just completely in the lay-by, in the gutter, and having to sort of deal, deal with the issues themselves. And as much as they sort of talk a good game, they're very poor at sort of putting it into practice, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of um, sparked my interest in the, in the company. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. I can remember you came to a success quick start. It was very quiet when I first met you. I think you brought your brochures and yeah. uh, was having was having dinner at the time. And I sat next to you and you was, I think, was speaking to Safin and myself and we were talking to your brochures and stuff. And then after, when we spoke after to gather your thoughts on the day, I can remember the first time I spoke to Emma because you passed on the phone to Emma and that was the first time she was obviously checking me out. You know, if, you know, how is things? What's the process? 
And uh, that was kind of the first instance where I thought, yeah, this is, you know, there's, there's something here from a couple perspective where they're going to help each other, which is great. Um, great. So let's go on to, you know, the business that you initially joined Shift Success with, which is the dog grooming business. Obviously, Emma is an ex-vet. She's a veterinary nurse mm-hmm. and uh, she's got a dog grooming business. And essentially, due to the business mentorship and Shift Success, you essentially decide to help her in that business. Talk to me about the things that you helped Emma with with that business. Yeah, so um, like I said, she started in 2005 and sort of went on board with her dad and he helped her a lot with sort of the initial startup and um, Emma started doing it in people's houses. So she'd go to them. 2005, there was no Facebook, there was no Google, sort of, there was no internet advertising. It was all um, like yellow pages and hence the name A to Z Animal Care. We wanted to be at the top of the yellow pages, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she was a veterinary nurse and she did ask to stay as a veterinary nurse, but they said no. And so she said, right, I'll leave. It was quite a brave move, wasn't it? I'll leave, I'll go and retrain and be a dog groomer. She wanted to earn money for herself. She was fed up with making money for the vets and not being given the responsibility or anything like that. So I don't know when um, the relationship between her and her dad was always like, you know, it's father, daughter, but it's also a business partner. And it doesn't didn't always gel right. He had his ideas, he had his ways that he wanted to do it. We quickly, uh, he, Emma and her dad quickly took on a member of staff, so quickly started to scale it. But um, he was doing, he does a, a lot of stuff himself and he was putting a lot of effort into the business, but wasn't really getting the rewards that he wanted. Mm-hmm. So we'd gone through the VAT threshold, we were charging VAT. And I remember, you know, I was getting a bit more interested in it. And I was like, Facebook was around. I'm like, why, we should be on Facebook. And he was like, well, I'm not on Facebook. So why should we be on Facebook? And I was like, oh, it's a bit awkward in it. And uh, well, you can do it if you want. So I sort of doing some Facebook stuff. And we came to us a bit of a head. Um, we were all sitting in a pub garden one, one day and Emma's dad was like, I'm not happy with the, I'm putting a lot of effort into this business. You know, he'd, he'd helped Emma through the business when we were having our children and sort of kept it going for us. So, but he was like, I'm not getting enough financially out of it. So he gave us three choices and that was um, to reduce the business below the VAT threshold, which I just, just couldn't understand whatsoever on how that was supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, I think it was three choices or maybe it was just two or, um, you know, put more effort in ourselves maybe and look to scale it but wasn't really sure how or he would leave and um, me and Emma sort of went away and we're like we can do this together we we have to do this together and we we bought him out of the business so then we just turned around it was just it was me and Emma but no one teaches you how to run a business do they <laughs> no, no, no they don't no they don't uh, you're not, you know it's not like a school thing right and another thing like we're not taught about finance to school I know or investments or you know how to manage debt and i find it crazy where you know going into a university you can get hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of debt to fund that yeah. but when it comes to maybe getting a mortgage they want blood from you and they want to know you know past history they want to know thing and also a business loan right it's harder to get a business loan compared to um student debt so great stuff so you and emma again power team against the world, yes. yeah. yeah against the world by the sounds of it decide to um basically buy dad out buy your father-in-law out and you start helping emma in the business and at this time you're obviously seeking help with guidance and support with business um can you remember the one of the first things because me and you and emma jumped on the zoom call can you remember the first actions that you did with your business when we once we signed up with you yeah what was the one uh, of the first things well one of the first things was um started a Facebook group <laughs> I yeah, remember yeah. You saying because we were just um, going into lockdown weren't we and you're like start a Facebook group and get your customers on board and engaged and start showing them how to do stuff and I was like well surely if you show them how to cut a dog's toenails you you're like they, they, they'll do it themselves and you're like no they won't they'll, they'll struggle and then they'll come back to you and uh, put prices up <laughs> yeah that's the big one that's what I was waiting for that was the one I was waiting for yeah, put your prices up and reduce your reduce your costs. So, um, yeah, you caused quite a few sleepless nights. 
<laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> Thanks. You, 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 had a, you had a much uh, darker beard now. I've just caused this massive amount of stress, but it got yeah. you. It's got you. It's good. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. So you start taking action. And, and I will say for anyone listening, um, you and Emma, you get shit done. You, you put in the work. There's no question about your work ethic. You know, you just get on with it. You execute. You take action. Yeah, it's scary. I can remember you was, you know, the raising the prices thing, a big one was like, oh, you know, customers are going to leave, but you still did it. You got over that comfort zone, which is absolutely amazing. So talk to me about your typical customer. You know, I've got two dash rounds. Um, would, would, and you've got dash rounds now, I know. Would, would you, would I just, would it be me coming into your, yeah. your shop? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you're, you are a typical customer. Um, you know, well, everyone there's so many different types of dog owners out there so we we service people that you know their gardener or their cleaner brings their labrador in once a month for a dog wash all the way through to sort of um someone that might live on a council estate and they they save up every sort of six to eight weeks to pay for their their beloved dog and to be washed and trimmed and everywhere in between and you know everyone our services are open to everyone. And uh, if they've got a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a guinea pig, that we have something that we can offer them. So in a way you sort of talk about your target customer, but sometimes that can be quite so broad, you have to sort of cast your net wide to, to find them. And yeah. um, that's why I sort of feel like Facebook, Instagram, Google websites, there's something there to appeal to everyone. Mm. Uh, rather than just sort of going down the one route, which I've done for my other business. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing stuff. So going, just going on to the dog grooming uh, business with Emma again, you know, where was you when you first, well, before you joined Shift Success and, and where are you with that business uh, now? You know, like, you know, it could be revenue, it could be team members, anything kind of yeah. you can share. So we came into Shift Success, um, we had... Uh, I think it was five team members at the time. And we could see that, um, you know, we were getting busier. We, this is classic and you'll recognize it. You know, we were getting busier and busier and busier. So we were having lots more inquiries. But to service that, we then just took on more people. Mm. So we're getting busier. We take on more people. They want more pay. And where it hits us is in the profit margin. So we're like, why our turnover is going up, but our costs are going up and our profit is going down because we're using our profit to then pay for that, for, for the busyness. So uh, it's that sell cycle of doom, isn't it? Like, like we've been taught, you know. So we came to Shift to Success and I was always like, what do we do? I mean, there must be a ceiling on our prices. There must be a point where people won't pay anymore for having their dog room. So once we've hit that ceiling and our costs keep carrying, keep going up to that ceiling, we're just going to live with nothing. So what do we do? And then that's, that's where I suppose we've had that feeling for a few years and we tried different mentorship, you know, speaking to different mentors, but they were quite, quite generic and didn't really um, inspire us, inspire us with any sort of useful information really. Um, but then the shift to success program was just, I don't know, it just felt like a really good fit because it kind of take, took, took us back to basics hmm. um, with, the, with the model, with the ideas and then the, the sort of planning and stuff. Took us back to basics. And although we've had, we'd been in business for like 14, 15 years or 14, 15 years, going back to the, the very beginning, you're still learning new stuff. And then... Um, put on top of that the, the specific business advice that you and the other mentors are starting to give us like our pricing and our staffing and you know reduce your costs increase your prices to make your margins better it's all starting to work so you know and then you then you introduce the amazing people within your community that um so like you you linked us up with megan saint and i've got to say without finding megan we probably wouldn't have dealt with the staffing issue because we had to go through some um, redundancies. And I'll tell you, I'd never do that on my own. I'd never make people redundant on my own. And it's really stressful. But because we had that contact with Megan and, you know, we used her services, that enabled us to get things done and reduce our costs. Yeah. You know, and we can do the same amount of work with less people. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I, mean, I agree. Megan is amazing. Um, Great. So what, so there's lots of dog groomers out there, 
as mm. it's fair to say, there's lots and lots of dog groomers out there, and we'll go into your second business in a second. Uh, I know what separates you from the competition. But I'm wondering, do you know what separates you from the What would you say you and what separates you and Emma from the competition with dog groomers, do you reckon? I think it's definitely the um, the customer service. Um, you know, we really pride ourselves on really good customer service and we'll work with people. It's the, um, the sort of the reviews and the, the customer base that we have, whether that be like um, recommendation, people recommend they, recommending us or the reviews that we've got on Facebook and Google. Um, when you come into the shop, it's that really nice feeling because the team works so well together and everyone, I'd like to say everyone is happy in the shop. And I think that passes through. And then it's the consistency of the service that people get and the consistency of the haircut that the pets get. And the, the fact that the pets, I don't know if you can tell if the dog is smiling, but some people say to us, you know, the dog came out smiling. Yeah, uh, That's probably like the, the full sort of waggle, yeah. you know. And we celebrate our customers. We celebrate when they leave us reviews. We sort of celebrate the fact that I celebrate it with our staff to make to sort of keep them happy and I also celebrate it with with our, our big customer base and so I think it's just that whole sort of you know it's a nice place to take your take your pet and we'll look after your pet and we've got many services that can help your pet mm. and you know we've got experience there when when we like if we took your dachshund in it would have like a full MOT because it, we'd find all the lumps and bumps and cuts and you know, abscesses and broken nails and maybe um, teeth issues. And we just work with you as a, as a client rather than a customer. Yeah, I love that. It's a genuine care I've noticed throughout, you know, your engagements. When I see you online producing content, the absolute care and customer service just stands far beyond any other dog groomers that I've seen in all fairness. Um, what I love about you and Emma as well is that you've been in business for 15 years before we met or 13 years, you said. Um, that and the ability to... and it, probably the way you are right now is that I see a lot of people in the business world. They've been in business for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, five years, no matter what it is, but you and Emma and those who gain results have absolute humility, right? Same with, you know, myself, like I don't know everything in the world, but I'm willing to learn to get me to that result. And I feel like with yourself and Emma, despite your years of being in business, you know, you join shift success with an open mind and the ability to lean in on things that you may not know or have implemented. And I think that trait in itself helps people become financially successful and live in life on their terms with happiness. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that in you and Emma, because um, anyone listening to this, you know, if you've been in business for years, the moment you start thinking, you know, it all complacency sets in yeah. and when complacency sets in, you put your foot off the pedal and unfortunately, there's some whippersnapper who's going to eat up, um, you know, behind you in relation to competition. So I just want to acknowledge you on that. So let's talk about your new business then, Bill. So um, if that wasn't, you know, as, as you know, driven and as purposeful as it was, you know, and as stressful as it was building a business while you're transferring from the police as well, um, you decided to launch another business. For everyone who's listening right now, what is that new business and how did that come about? So the new business is um, called Pet Passion to Profit. Um, so we started with yourself in March and uh, like March last year, and me and Emma were always looking at ways of getting me out of the police. So we started to think, well, how can we earn money within A to Z Animal Care to get me out of the police? And the initial idea was to go into training. So Emma would, Emma's currently doing her training qualifications. We'd set up a, a dog groomer training school, and then I would provide like a business bolt on. So we say like, okay you you can do your you can do your dog groomer training but do you know how to take that forward and turn it into a business now we've had to put that on back onto a back burner for for the time being because um because of some of issues with staff um chloe is is pregnant we're really sort of happy for her but it means that um we've had to do some retraining and rejigging inside the shop so i was like well, that kind of puts that on a bit of a back burner and how do i get out so Christmas, uh, I was sitting around at Christmas, I think it was, and uh, I suddenly, you know, all these lessons and all these people that you listen to and all the people within the code, the members um, of Shift to Success that are doing online businesses. And it just, 
you just absorb it. You kind of like soak it in and you start thinking about it. And people say, you know, you need to be online. You need an online presence. You know, online businesses are really good and will do, will do really well. And so I thought, well, if I was going to deliver um, business training to the people that we um, teach how to be dog groomers, why can't I just deliver business training to dog groomers anyway? And then we've obviously seen your model in we're inside your model and and i it started off as that as i like, i'll just i'll design a course for dog groomers like a business course and help them and uh i was like right i'm gonna do this and it, as it was christmas and new year i was like i need to be out there now i i need to be on social media i need to be on facebook and instagram now because they're going to be looking at their phones over christmas whilst they're eating all their chocolate and turkey and i want to i want to be present so um i came up with a name it wasn't it's not the name that i was now i came up with the name as be the groomer so be the groomer that you want to be and so that was like the concept um and i reached out to vinay the graphic designer and said right i've, I've stolen i don't know if you can see it i stole the a to z um, yeah. logo and repurposed it Another yeah. thing that we're taught, you know, yeah. and put be the groom around it. I reached out to Vinay, who's um, a graphic designer and stuff, and said, "Right, make me a make me a new logo, make me a Facebook um, banner." And I, I literally spent the afternoon creating a Facebook page, creating a Facebook group, um, and an Instagram account, and that was it. That's all I started with. And um, I was like, "Well, how do I find people? Fine, I'll just go." We know uh, like Colin Taylor, he was on Pooch Perfect and stuff. And Emma was like friends with him on Facebook, but I just knew if I went to his Instagram account, I'd find dog groomers. So then I'd start following dog groomers and anyone who had a sniff of being a dog groomer, I'd follow them. And then when they um, when they followed me back, I'd just dropped them a little message and said, hi, you know, I run a, um, a, a business, uh, Facebook pay, uh, Facebook group, why don't you come over and join it? And that is when it just started. And started, people started coming into the group. And then I had to get over all my like um, fears of doing lives and stuff, I suppose. Well, you know, let's that's, 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 that's talk about your growth. So um, obviously, you know, I've seen you shift success. You haven't done lives before. You've been in the job for many, many years, right? I can remember, I hope you don't mind me saying on a live interview, it's going to go out in the world. You hated sales. I do. Yeah, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you hated it. You, you know, I had to push you at times, jump on the phone with people you didn't like. I know Emma was kind of giving you a nudge as well. And yeah, right. And, you know, you haven't done lives. You haven't been, you know, put yourself out there. Really. But now all of a sudden you've had this massive growth. And I'm going to I'm going to say this because it, it made me a bit tearful when I saw it. Now, a very good friend of yours, John Dean, hmm. um, said something about a, a comment you used to get in the police, which is Eeyore. Yeah. and when I saw that I had a bit of a tearful moment and John said that he's seen a massive change in you mm. um due to you know you just you know being focused on something else and that is something that I wish more people would take to heart is that it's not just about the finances we're going to what you're achieving in a minute because I think it's amazing the sales that you're bringing in but the human growth that you've gained from getting outside your comfort zone doing things you're not comfortable with and also building a life for you and Emma that mm. and your kids that have just been absolutely transformational. So, you know, I really want people to get that. It's not just about the finances and the money. It's about the internal growth you get as well. Um, so let's talk about sales and obviously the community you've built. You've, you've built a great Facebook group of your of your ideal target customers. People are reaching out. They're, they're giving you amazing comments that like you saved their business. You're helping their business. You've, you're increasing their profits. And now, and quite rightly so, and I think, you know, I should, I probably would advise you to actually increase your prices even more. You're actually, <laughs> you're making sales. You shared in the community of the day that you uh, onboarded a client for £2,000. How does that make you feel? You you worked in the job on a monthly basis. You must get paid without overtime, maybe about, what, 2700 800 but Well, yeah, well, yeah, I went part-time as well. So it was 2000 so I, I'm leaving on two thousand pounds a month. That's my time at home. And in one client, you had two thousand pound sales. How does that make you feel from a value perspective? You know, you work in thirty days in the job, and you work what? If it could be a thirty-minute call. Yeah, it's um, you know, I, I started to see it. My eyes were starting to open. So 
um, a, a, what, a year or so ago, we we started um, breeding Labradors, and this was this was one of the sort of pivotal moments as well, where I suddenly realised, you know, we can have a litter of Labradors and almost make um, or two litters almost make half my salary in selling puppies. And I, I go around, I, I walk around work now, going, I can't believe that, you know, you can make almost make your. <clears throat> my goal this year was to make my salary in in puppies. And we, we obviously, we do really nice um, Labradors and trying to get into the Dachshund breeding, but it was just like amazing that you could make that money um, selling puppies. And then you go in and you look at people like um, Vicky Sharp and Katie Saywell, and it's like, they're, they're running their courses online and their dog training and they're, they're doubling my money. <laughs> they're doubling my money doing dog training. And I suddenly realized that Police officers are very badly paid, and I, I, I have been a bit naughty, and I've sat there in offices with chief inspectors before, saying your salary is rubbish for what you have to put up with and what you have to deal with, and I generally mean that. And the the salary that we're getting paid as police officers in return for what we have to do is so poor, and my eyes were starting to be open that there's so much money out there, and you just need to find a way to do it. You need to find a way to capture that money. Money's always circling around, right? We just need to add value so we can pluck that out of the ether and bring it into our own lifestyles, right? And I will say this as well. A lot of people, cops work overtime. In fact, people, NHS work overtime, right? And NHS have you know a lot of experiences similar to police officers. Um, but nothing, whether you're on £100,000, £250,000, nothing is worth it when it affects your mental health. Health yeah. is number one. And you know, if anything... You know, nothing is worth it, in my opinion, that's going to change this in your physical health. It's everything, right? And ultimately, you know, the suicide rate is as high as it is. That, to me, is just a risk that I don't want any of my family members to make. And, you know, obviously people that have, have joined Shift's success. Um, yeah, and you're right. It obviously makes you feel great. You're actually, you know, closing these sales now at £2,000. Where, where do you see yourself going financially now? Because for you, you made a commitment, I believe, to actually... I leave the pension before you left the job right yeah so you know we keep talking about um pivotal moments and again coming out of the pension i got to that point where whatever happens i'm not going to stay in the police for much longer um so pre i think it was november i came out of the pension is i suppose it is a a difficult decision for some people but that probably really accelerated my my opportunities because that like you said it saves you so much money I was then able to go part-time in the police and then you know you start working on your working on your business and working on increasing your sort of um, productivity within your business so you can start making those sales and you've got more time to do that rather than sort of sitting at work being frustrated I suppose um so it was really interesting to see how how much you can scale a business when you start opening up your time and coming out of the pension was definitely one one thing that helped with that amazing but you're right about the sales I mean Emma was standing here one day and she was like you need to pick up that phone and speak to that customer it was almost like she wanted to see me making that phone call so that she knew that she could trust me in making sales if that makes sense yeah um and I remember like people pushing me saying you accountability wise you need to start making those calls and um I started doing some Facebook stuff with members of um, shift success around like helping them with Instagram and I was suddenly starting to realize I quite enjoy talking to people I quite enjoy talking to people on zoom and and seeing different people so I think that helped as well it kind of broke down those barriers just by like accountability accountability calls accountability buddies although you don't realize it, it it means you're connecting with absolute strangers who you don't know but suddenly they're, they're they're really friendly and they're open to what you're sort of saying and vice versa and they become your friends and you're always sort of talking to them and that but it, subconsciously it breaks down that barrier because straight away i'm talking to an absolute stranger yeah and absolutely that, and that's it right that yeah. that's it with sales sales is not about you know, a car salesman trying to you know sell off a dodgy car to you. It's about building a connection, a relationship with someone. And actually, when sales are done correctly, it doesn't actually feel like a sale. If you've got to push yeah. someone into a sale, that's going to cause other problems in the future. 
Um, and it is just essentially, you've got a problem, here's a solution. And you do that very, very well now. And you, know, you post a picture in our community, you've got your headset on, very prepared. And that's great to see for me and obviously the team, because you know, that's what it takes to build a successful business. And once you develop that skill of sales, well, then you can then teach that to your team and they can bring in the sales for you. So, yeah. you know, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, Bill, what, what skill sets do you believe you've had as a police officer that have helped you build, well, help scale the initial business, but actually help build this business to where it's now going? Um, it's definitely, the, it's got to be the, like the communication, isn't it? And changing your communication styles, depending on who, you, who you're who you talking with. So I'm talking with people that um, live all over the country. Um, they, they're all from all different kind of backgrounds. And you're having to sort of just moderate how you talk to them and like how you come across and the language that you're using. It's definitely um, a way of moderating your language within within the pet grooming world they're not used to all that business jargon and stuff like that so it's it's being able to put it into simple terms and taking away some of that jargon so that people find it less intimidating or easier to speak about this having that drive to help people as well you know we all joined we all joined the police service to help people and that's number one on our list most of the time is to try and help someone well now i get to help people i'm helping far more people with my business um be it through for free through the facebook group you know i'll go out my way to help people maybe i might get told off about doing that but, <laughs> um, but also when they are when they do sign up to a one-to-one or a training day or an instagram course or whatever courses i put on in the future i love spending that time with people and breaking down those barriers and making it easy for them to learn and then saying you know you can take this board and push it forward so it's that it's that drive to help, um, that drive to help people. And I honestly don't feel um, that anything I do will be detrimental to the people because I honestly want them to succeed. And it's like we were saying earlier, you know, I want them to succeed. And that will also reflect nicely on me as well. So that's kind of my goal is to get them. A lot of these dog groomers that I'm helping, they're just like so overwhelmed with business. And I'm like, I know what I know what that's like. I've been there and I've no ways to, to help you and get through that. So it's really nice to see them come out the other side and it's like, wow, it's it's like I can actually push my business on now and you've helped me. And that's what we want, isn't it? Absolutely. Amazing stuff. I couldn't agree more. I want to talk about you and Emma, uh, the dynamic between you and Emma. Um as I mentioned, you know, uh, you and Emma are a powerhouse of couple. I have never seen, and you know, I'm going to say this because I'm not going to say obviously say your names, but there's there's, there's people I have conversations about uh, where where a police officer, male or female, he's going through a hard time in the job. They want this change, and there's quite a lot of spouses where they don't necessarily quote allow their other half to pursue something that they want to pursue because of fear of it going wrong or failure or whatever it may be. Right. And for me, I'm like, you know, I'm quite blunt on my podcast. Why would you want to be with someone who, who doesn't support your dreams, right. Or support your vision or support your health just because you're worried about a certain situation. And Kelly Statham, who's been on the podcast, she was in a very bad place. You know, she wanted to, you know, kill herself essentially. Yeah. And Kevin, her husband allowed her to give her that time away. Now, obviously that's a, you know, a real serious issue, but even if someone's not liking their job, that's still happiness being taken away from someone with you and Emma, um, you know, for you not liking the job, she has been a key pillar to your success, right? She has been an absolutely an amazing woman. Um, she supports you, she backs you all the way. She gives you a nudge when needed. And that utter belief in you is inspiring. It really, really is. Um, What's the dynamic like? Do you separate each other's roles and responsibilities? Do you go, right, Emma, I'm going to do this or you do this? How does that dynamic work for, for a power couple like yourselves? Power, uh, power couple. I think, um, I think you've got to realise that it can business, business between, like in relationship, you've got to recognise that it can cause tension. And um, like Emma the other day said to me, right, you've done something within your business, which I want to be part of, I need you to talk to me about it. You know, she is part of my business. So maybe I don't talk to her as much as I should do, but I think it helps that Emma is in business and Emma was always um, 
she was never worried about me being in the like being out on the streets like with a firearm and stuff. She always knew that I would sort myself out, but she was always worried about the organisation and um, what the, how the organisation would hang me out to dry. So I think she had that drive, or she has that drive for me to get out as well, so that I'm I'm safe. And being a business lady herself, she knows that it's possible to um, to 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 find your career else, elsewhere and to, to drive your business. But, um, you know, it's tough at times with this, lots going on with business. There's like paperwork. I mean, the desk covered in paperwork at the moment. And Emma said to me the other day, I'll get them into the door and I'll do a really good job. I'm just not really too bothered about the other bits. That's from like me to sort out, I suppose, or for us to delegate. And we've done a lot of delegation over the last um, 12 months, you know, with the HR, I spent, I probably spent months trying to write a handbook and contracts for our employees. And then Megan just goes and does it in a couple of weeks and it's done. Mm-hmm. You know, um, accountancy, bookkeeping, graphic design, all this stuff that I probably spent ages trying to get done. It just gets done now. And that's what drives it forward. So then hopefully that will then free up time for me and Emma to spend together. So it's just working as a team and um her support and her belief i suppose is what's enabled me to do what i'm doing and she's a really good mentor herself you know if i've got a a customer that i'm not too sure what to do with i can go to emma and she's like we'll do this do this do this and it it works she's fantastic at um working out business problems as well so i always say to my the people i sign up you know you're getting access to me and emma and emma can do the practical stuff and has business ideas as well as well as me so it's that teamwork isn't it absolutely and i see it. it's, it's absolutely amazing it really is um do, can emma see, oh, she, i don't know she, she obviously can i'm is, is it does she see a difference in you um in your happiness your liveliness yeah i think so i hope so um i definitely um think i'm a lot better like with the children I think the relationship when I went sick uh, I took a, a month off sick and instantly the relationship with the children just changed and got better mm. um the person that says the most is my mum and I was I was um, talking to her the other day and I was driving home and and she just went I don't know where she calls me William she's like I don't know where <laughs> this William has come from she just doesn't understand she, not that doesn't understand in a bad way but she just it's like I can't believe where, you, where you've come from in the last sort of, I suppose the last six months, the change has been different again and the change has been positive again. And um, I did a, a Facebook Live with someone of Lobby the other day for his mental health awareness. And he said, he said, you talk to a police, you're a bit like this, but as soon as you talk about business, you're just, you just light up. And that's, that's the change, isn't it? And so people do recognize it and that Eeyore, the EO is not there anymore. I'll I'll talk to anyone about business and that for a very long time and bore them. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I, honestly, I got goose got to see as well goosebumps right now when you said that. It's absolutely amazing. Um Bill, you've you've been through a lot in the police. You've had obviously um, you know, situations with your mindset, you've been on medication. You know, ultimately, you've had a pension, you've gone through the pension changes, um, been through stressful times in business initially, um, and you'll carry on to be stressful in business. But for you, what's changed in your life as a result of making the decisions that you've made? Um, Where are you in the, are you you off medication now? Are you, um, how do you feel about your future? Yeah, I can see myself um, coming off medication. I don't, I mean, I'm a bit naughty where I don't t- take it at the moment where I should. Um, so I need to sort of do that sensibly. But it's like um, it's quite, it's like lifting that curtain. You you're so like um, so it's so narrow minded within the police at times. You're so focused and institutionalized. You just don't see any life outside outside of work. And it's kind of what you said about when you first start your course you you get books sent to you and you get recommended reading and podcasts i used to watch the news i used to read the mail online i used to do all that and but now it's like if i'm driving to work or or where i was driving to work i'd listen to radio 4 and listen to the news and stuff but now it's i listen to a podcast and now i'll not only listen to those podcasts i don't i sort of identify maybe there's parts of my facebook group that could 
be benef- benefit from that podcast. So I then share that podcast with them to try and help them and educate them and open their eyes to business as well. And it's that broadening those horizons. So, um, and then the future wise, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing this. My, my initial goal, I suppose, really was just cover my wage. I want, I want out, I want to have a better lifestyle. You know, I took the dogs for an hour's walk this morning. I want to spend time with the kids. I, want, I used to enjoy taking them to school and picking them up. Um, and I want something interesting to do, which I've got. But I actually wrote down one of my goals the other day, and that was to make a superintendent's wage by um, the 14th of April, 2022. So that is one goal. And I don't think I'm gonna to have to work hard for that. I, I think- You're gonna smash that. Yeah, I think it's gonna. I don't want to. I don't want to come across big-headed or anything like that. But it's that is easy. That is yeah. easy to do once you find that niche and you find that product. So, I'm. I'd be more than happy with two grand a month and covering my mortgage. You know, I, we 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 um, worked really hard to reduce our costs to take the pressure off us. So our overheads at home and stuff like that. But. If I can make sixty-eight grand and I only work one day a month or one day a week, I'm going to do it, aren't I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> get the cocktails out. It's yes, good. Yeah, that's right. Why wouldn't you? So that is a goal. And I was thinking about goal setting the other day. And uh, me and Emma, when we first started Shift to Success, the goal in, on the vision board, which I've got over there, is to leave the police. And it was June 2022. And then the um, situation changed a bit in the police. And I said to him, I just can't do this anymore. She was like, okay, let's change the goal and make that July 2021. So that was going to be that goal. But now it's April 2021, you know, because it's just accelerated it. And you're right about having those goals, writing those goals down. It opens, it focuses your mind and it, it pushes you towards that goal. It pushes, it makes sure that you you achieve that goal when you write it down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And let's, let's talk about that, right? So you've achieved what I'm a lot, trust me, the conversations I have with people in the police or beyond nurses, etc. you've achieved what a lot of people dream of, right? Building a successful business and uh, you have handed in your resignation. And that is a very pivotal point in anyone's life, right? You've, you've achieved freedom, you've built freedom, right? There's no more shackles on you anymore. There's no more pension holding you back. You are living life on your terms and you and Emma have put in the work for that. How does that make you feel knowing that, if, in fact, the build up? let's talk about the build-up, let's, let's get to the saucy bits first. How did you feel that emotion of writing out your resignation? Oh my God, this is gonna go in. Yeah, I mean, uh, the things at work changed. I was moved to a different department and I thought maybe I could do this, but I was just like, no, you know, it's really, really sort of, the department was nice, but the situation was just horrible. And I remember speaking to you and you're like, you just got to go. You, you got to go and it creates that space. And so I went home to Emma and sort of said, you know, I spoke to Alex and, um, you know, I think we just, I just need to resign. And she was like, Let's do it then. And that was it. It wasn't like, oh, how are we going to pay the mortgage or how, how are we going to find like pay pay for food and stuff? She was like, we've got our buffers. We've got money in the bank. We've got money in the business where we've saved and saved and saved. Just do it and you'll find a way. And so I think um, I wrote out the res- resignation. I typed it out. And then what I, what I do a lot is I think about the group. I think about the Shift Success group and I, I, it spurs me on to post stuff like, the winds and stuff like that. And you probably get like sick of me at some point, but <laughs> I could see what would the group say? And then, so I put the letter into the group and uh, everyone was like, date it, put a date on it, do it, <laughs> do it, do it. There's yeah. like all of these messages coming in and like the yeah. end saying, come on, put a date on it. <laughs> um, I was like, no, I had, I had a date in my head and um, for, to, for it to be July, but it was getting really awkward at work because um, they wanted me to do like a portfolio for teaching and then they wanted me, so it was to teach probation as training and they had a new class coming up, which they wanted me to be part of. And I felt a bit, a little bit of a fraud if, you know, mm. in the sense that, you know, I was doing my day job, but I didn't really want to be there and I wasn't going to be there going forward. So, and then, you know, I did this um, stuff at, uh, at home with the business and it just started to take off and I came up with a brand new product I met a, 
an, another person outside Shift Success that really wanted to be on board with me. And we just came, we just brainstormed this new product. And I said, we can sell this. And then that gave me the, the sort of the, the outlook that the money is there. The money is waiting. I just need to go and get it now. And I need time to do that because um, working three days a week and then I was working four days a four days a week at home, trying to build up the presence, the Facebook group, the lives, and then do the products at the same time. So I was like, no, it's time to go. And uh, it was it was actually an easy decision. So that must mean that it was the right decision. And, and how did, did it feel empowering? Scary? But was it, was it, no? No, it wasn't, no. not scary, not scary at all. Um, I don't know, it's a really strange feeling. It's just like, it's a transition. I, I suppose I, I sort of tell people at work, I've, I've mentally, I mentally left the police like a year ago or so. Um, so mentally I probably left and I was just doing it for a wage. So I think this is more of a, a transitional thing. You yeah. know, I'd never have done it without finding the program. There's no way I'd ever have the confidence, but I just feel as a, with, with the team and the people now in the community, there's not a single problem that I can come against in business or in personal life, where I can't turn around to someone and say, what do you think? You know, how am I going to move this? How am I going to get over this hurdle? Or how are we going to get over this hurdle? Because there is someone in the community that knows something about something. So any issues that we come up against, there is someone there to sort of help us. Amazing. Amazing. Bill, what would you say to someone like yourself who... It's got a pension. They're not happy with the police. They're not seeing the kids as much. Um, they're becoming a bit snappy at home. They maybe not feeling like they want to stay in the job, but they're just staying there for a salary. What would you say to that individual? Maybe even yourself, um, who is thinking about doing new life in business. I meet these people. I meet these people daily. <laughs> you know, while I'm still walking around at work, and I am a, a big advocate of the program the shift to success program and that's what i say to them it's like i i give them the podcast i give them the youtube channel and the facebook group and say watch look learn you know get be, become part of it it will change mm. your life and that's so true isn't it um the son i was talking to yesterday he just wants out he just can't do it anymore he doesn't care about the pension anymore and i'm like let's do it let's do it together and i'll help you and we'll get you into the community and um, we'll, we'll sort it out. That's, that's the one thing that I want to sort of try and get across to people. And I probably can't reach enough people, but I think it's one thing that coppers have an issue with is they just can't see outside of the blinkers and they, they get so down and they go down this really horrible road, but don't, can't see a way out. And that's when it ends really badly for them. But there is, there is a way out. You know, that pension just doesn't doesn't mean anything anymore. And you can make, you can triple your money outside the police and do less work. It is possible, isn't it? Hundred percent. You've got people that do it. We, exactly right. And and we I mean, we won't talk about investments now, but just the investment strategy that now you do and I do, uh, and other people who've joined, you know, shift success and investment success. It's like, why would you ever have a pension knowing that you can achieve what you can achieve? With a completely passive investment strategy, but we'll save that for another one uh, yeah. in the future. Um, Bill, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? I'd never have um, classed myself as an entrepreneur. I'd never thought. I kind of had that imposter syndrome about me to that kind of sort of said, "No, you're not. You're not worthy of that." But now it means um, having that freedom to. Um, you're not tied down to a job. You're not tied down to a boss. You're free to do what you want to do. And so I've got my, I'll have my core products in place. And only yesterday I was looking at a comment in my group and just went, what about this? We could do this. You know, and I don't know if you saw the post that I put into Shift to Success about it. It's like, that's another avenue that we could go down, you know, and potentially that could be a quite a good avenue to go down. So that's what entrepreneurship is for me is having that ability to use your brain and have that freedom to put in place new products and test and see if they work. And if they don't work, you've tried it. If they do work, it's going to fly because yep. you've got all that experience and knowledge behind you as well. 
absolutely amazing absolutely amazing bill um i just want to say you know from the bottom of my heart how proud i am of you seeing you grow i know this is only the beginning of your mm-hmm. entrepreneurial journey um, i'm also proud of emma i know emma's watching so hey emma um and you know your your future i'm very excited to see it grow and also i just want to say thank you um you, the support as a member in our community you show up daily you help people you reply to comments you've won the top performer sorry the uh the uh co member of the month uh you know pretty much every month um, and, that's re- <laughs> and that's a result of you showing up you know you you do the work yes you're fearful yes you're you know wanting you know you don't want to get outside your comfort zone but you do it regardless and you know your story your your work ethic your success is a beacon of hope for a lot of people out there and um, a lot of people look up to you um they really do because you've made it work you've had these issues that a lot of people go through in the job, you've built something, you and Emma, and you've gained this phenomenal freedom for yourself. And there's no looking back. And um, it is just a remarkable, remarkable journey. And uh, I just want to say, I'm proud of you. Very proud. I know the team is, and um, you know, I've possibly you become a shift success coach in the future. Um, I really do see that happening. So um, I want to say thank you and uh, you know, keep being you bill. Um, Absolutely amazing. No more, as you said, no more Eeyore. Right. That's, that's, that's the amazing thing. Um, so where can people reach out to you, Bill? Where can people stalk you? So um, you'll recognize me on Facebook. I've got my professional photo in as, as my profile picture. Yes. If you have to see me. So Bill Betts on Facebook. Um, if you request me, that's fine. That's great. Um, so direct message. The uh, business is um, Pet Passion to Profit. So again, Facebook group dog grooming, business, help and support. If you are a pet groomer or you're looking to get into pet grooming, um, email again, petpassiontoprofit1 at gmail.com. So get in touch. And honestly, if anyone wants to talk to me about the journey or, you know, if you've got customers that might be a little bit like, oh, I don't know whether I want to sign up, you know, come and come and speak to me and we'll get you signed up. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know it's been a long one, but I couldn't stop myself. It was, you just want to, you know, just hear your story. And there's some stories I didn't even know about you as well. So really fun episode. Um, one of my best. And uh, I'll be seeing you very soon inside the Shift Success community. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, really appreciate your comments. Me and Bill will get back to them in due course. And, uh, and yeah, I'll be seeing you all on the next episode. Take care, Bill. Thank you so much.